So welcome everybody to this morning's session about quantum error correction. The first talk this morning is about efficient soft output decoders for the surface code. This is work by Nadine Meister, Chris Patterson, and John Preskill. And Nadine will give a talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Nadine, and today I'll talk about um, some work that we did started last summer with about Chris and John at Caltech. The first talk this morning is about efficient soft output decoders for the surface <laughs> code. I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so first we'll give a little bit of background and introduction on the surface code decoding, and then how we can turn those decoders into soft decoders, um, and then some numerical and analytical results. And then finally, the applications of these soft decoders to other relevant quantum information tasks. And finally, uh, we'll conclude. Okay, so the error correcting code that we studied was a surface code. And it consists of these theta, theta qubits as these like blue circles, and they all represent like one logical value. And so say uh, we're trying to correct some errors on these theta qubits or figure out what errors happened on these theta qubits. We have these Z and X checks to check for X and Z errors. And they're just a product of the Z or X stabilizers on the, on the neighboring qubits. And so for example, if there was an X error at one of the data qubits, then it, that doesn't commute with the neighboring uh, Z checks. And so those ones will produce some non-trivial syndrome results. Um, and so how do we fix these errors? That's where the decoding part comes in. Uh, we usually construct, we oftentimes construct this decoding graph. Um, and so here we've done it just for the Z, Z checks where, so all the nodes are Z stabilizers and all the errors are these X, like these error mechanisms on these data qubits. So these like an X error on a data qubit and an edge connects two nodes that it would, for example, like light up. Um, so now let P be the, this individual physical qubit error rate. So basically in this decode, like Z check decoding graph, that would be the probability that each of these like data qubits has an X error. Um, for this P, we're gonna define the edge weight to be the log likelihood ratio of P. Um, and so given this graph, now we need to come up with some algorithm or some decoder that'll tell us Okay, I see that there's some error happening near here. I wanna figure out which data qubits had that error. Um, and so the two most popular ones or most common ones for the surface code are this like minimum weight perfect matching decoder and the union find decoder. And the minimum weight perfect matching decoder works kind of exactly as it name sounds. Um, say we had some more errors and so some more uh, checks were, had some non-trivial results our minimum weight perfect matching decoder is going to try to find a perfect matching for all these, these red nodes, all the non-trivial ones. And so that just means like some pairing, some matching between the, these red nodes that has total weight as low as possible. And so for exa this example, that would just be saying, okay, this data qubit had this error and it lit up those two and this data qubit lit up those two. Okay, and so the union find decoder works uh, differently. Um, it's an almost linear time decoder, and it has two steps. The first is converting this bit flip decoding problem into an erasure decoding problem. Um, and so where an erasure is uh, this like third kind of error, an erase bit that we can represent as either identity or X error with equal probability at a specific known place. And that's kind of the key part. Um, and so how do we convert this into an erasure decoding problem? We again, start with our decoding graph um, with our non-trivial syndromes. And we start growing clusters around the, <laughs> around the red nodes. A little hard to see, but <laughs> there are these like beige circles around here that um, where basically we are growing this erased, uh, this erasure region. And so the, uh, uh, this like in this step, we like grow this erasure region to basically denote that all qubits near here and near here are now going to be denoted as erased. So they're either going to be identity or X at specifically these places. Um, and in here, maybe it's impossible to see, but this the clusters have grown such that they have merged, and now and we stop growing when all the clusters have merged, 
and specifically when there's an equal, an even number of uh, red nodes inside a cluster. Yeah, pretend the cluster is like that. <laughs> um, okay, and so lastly, then you want to correct the clusters as erasures inside. Um, and so lastly, like after you've merged all your clusters, you can correct them as erasures, which means you can like just find any um, correction within the clusters that satisfies the syndrome. Okay. Okay, so these are just uh, two decoders that return either like a yes or a no result. This is a logical failure. This is not a logical failure. Um, but we actually want to also output maybe like how sure the decoder is that it failed. So for example, I'm like 80% sure that I've produced a logical failure or not. Um, and so in order to do that, we uh, want to extract some soft output, we will call it phi, which approximates the probability that the decoder failed. Um, and to do so, we have come up with this algorithm where we essentially set all edge weights within the cluster to be zero. So pretend the clusters are here. <laughs> um, so all edge, edges inside there are zero. And then we want to find this minimum path between the one boundary to the other boundary. Um, and then we'll define phi to be the sum of like the two, basically the path that's left, left over. Um, and so the intuition for this is that in our union find algorithm, we were growing these like erased regions that we're gonna like, we're gonna call all the data qubits in there erasure errors now. And so we're essentially just like literally erasing them here by setting this edge width to zero. And why do we look at a path between inequivalent boundaries? Because in a surface code that denotes a logical failure. Um, and so basically when we were saying everything in here has been erased, like what's left, how uncertain is the decoder now? Um, okay, so this makes sense for union find because the clusters in union find, even though you can't see them, <laughs> are extremely important and like a crucial step in the uh, algorithm. But for minimum weight perfect matching, it's not clear what a notion of clusters might be, but there is this work by Yo done in 2022 um, where he kind of showed that, or like found this like analogous cluster idea in minimum weight perfect matching. And I guess the main idea is that minimum weight perfect matching can be formulated as a linear program where you're trying to minimize something exactly as the name this sounds. Um, and it's dual linear program is formulated as follows as well, where now we're trying to maximize the sum of these dual variables under the constraints that they all must be greater than zero and this like new slack definition also has to be greater than zero. And so what are what is this slack of E? Now we're gonna look at all edges E between non-trivial syndrome nodes, so between these red nodes. And we need to say that all, that this slack must be greater than zero, defined as the weight of this edge minus kind of all the YSs that like overlap this edge. Um, and so from there, you can kind of see how maybe these YSs denote clusters and that this YS is the radius of the cluster. Um, so I guess the main idea of this slide is that clusters do exist in minimum weight perfect matching. And so then we can use our algorithm that we've defined before to also extract soft output information. Okay. And so this is just like an algorithm that we came up with that extracted soft output, but we don't know if it's actually correlated with the decoder with the decoder failing. And so we ran some numerics to kind of see this correlation. And so here we have a surface code that we've, oh no, okay. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we ran some simulations um, where this surface code has phenomenological bit flip noise. So every single uh, qubit has the same probability of having an X error. Um, and we, we're able to show this like pretty correlated, cor like pretty nice correlation between phi, that path length that we defined before, and the log likelihood ratio of the probability that the decoder returned a logical failure given the syndrome. Okay, so these are just numerics though. So we want to see, can we prove anything about it analytically? And so first we looked at the repetition code, uh, kind of like an easier version. And we were able to actually show and that this is an equality here. Um, and how this theorem shows that, here consider the, okay, so consider we have a repetition with here, one, two, yeah, three, four, five. Did you manage to sleep yesterday? 
I, I think I did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, better than with <laughs> was like a with five, like so many people uh, like, with five cubits so in the many garbages. Yeah, we and... understand we shouldn't use a fit bottle now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, no, and okay, so, so let let the yeah. let's go. Okay, so the this repetition code the, has some yeah, error, right? Like yeah, yeah. industrial garbage. Like <laughs> all the business uh -huh. that I kind of yeah. yeah. So like I, my husband's okay. parents have uh -huh. like a business in well Napa, yeah. and their garbage uh -huh. doesn't need to care anything because it's industrial garbage and they take everything. Okay, even though um, and so the. <laughs> <laughs> the error, really there's some error that happened here, that and it produced this red so. syndrome. Um, and so the output okay, of the decoder is what we're going to call yeah. this orange line right here. The SDG is and always yeah. written somewhere where and we were able to show that the probability that the error was actually with this blue, orange line but we is do like three divided by the probability that the blue, blue, not that orange line. Okay, I did another thing. Yeah, we yeah. Have, uh, the log of that ratio is exactly this phi value that we've, this soft output value that we've defined before. Oh dear, which, which um, Where it's like the distance from one boundary to the other boundary with like everything inside set to zero. Zoom or YouTube? Okay, and I guess oh, how is this actually showing this relationship back here? Um, in So it's because in the repetition code, there are really only two options. It's either this orange or this green. And so essentially this denominator is the probability that there's a logical failure. Because if the, if the error was actually equal to this green, but the decoder outputted this orange, that like forms, like basically we flip, the decoder has flipped the orange line and the real error has flipped all the other lines. And that's like a path from one end to the other, a logical failure. So this denominator here is a logical failure. And similarly the top is one minus PL. Um, and so I guess kind of like the intuition and maybe like what's cool about like this, this result is that because of the way like log and division and probabilities work, we're really just showing that the weight of this green, so one, two, three, four, minus the weight of this orange one is three, which is out, like the weight of the soft output information. That's like essentially all we're showing here. <laughs> um, okay, so that was just for the repetition code. Now we want to show it for the surface code as well. And I guess, unfortunately, we were only able to show just like this lower bound, but we, but it, it's like a, in a similar manner where we defined F to be the decoder's output um, and M to be the output of the opposite logical class. So if you were to combine this orange and the green, we would again have like a path from top to bottom. Um, and so we were able to show that the log of the probability that the error is actually the one that the decoder outputted over the probability that the error is the minimum weight one of the opposite logical class is greater than or equal to phi. And I guess one thing to note is that we also really want to show this with these logical classes, not just F and M, um, but hopefully like this is like a prox or like ideally this is a good approximation. Oh yeah, and again, pretend there's clusters around the red dots. <laughs> okay, um, and so what are the applications of this soft? output. Um, this first one is was really like the inspiration for this, like coming up with a decoder that produces soft output. And it's for improving decoders of concatenated codes. And so specifically the hierarchical code, the, yeah, specifically the hierarchical code, where uh, the hierarchical code is a concatenated code with two layers, and the outer layer is an LDPC code. And the inner layer is a surface code. So each of those like physical qubits in the LDPC code, if you kind of like zoom in, then you would see a surface code. Each of those is a surface code. Um, but yeah, see Chris's talk tomorrow on hierarchical codes. Um, but essentially it's a way to use a good quantum LDPC code if you're restricted to geometrically local gates. Okay. And so when we ran uh, basically just like belief propagation on this outer decoder, and we didn't pass any information. Um, we just decoded the surface code, maybe got like a zero, decoded this one, got a one, and just passed that information into the outer code, then ran BP on that. That's what we see in this orange line. That's how the logical failure rate of the outer code scales with the inner code's failure rate. Um, but if we include the soft information, so maybe we've returned like a logical failure with like 10% or no logical failure with 100%, and passing that information through, that's where we get this blue, this blue line. Um, and we can see that, okay, maybe you can't see it. 
um, but there are dotted lines <laughs> to represent the, thre the pseudo thresholds, like around here and around here. And so we can see that the pseudo threshold increased or improved by a factor of two. Um, oh yeah, and also to note that this error floor, um, we just use BP. And so that's like any message passing algorithm will eventually hit an error floor. Okay, um, <laughs> there's also supposed to be a histogram here. Um, but the second application is for error detection. And in, um, so basically if you're trying to perform some uh, circuit sampling task and you want it to be super accurate, you would, yeah, you want it to be really accurate, then you would maybe construct this large error correcting code that has, so in order to have a very low error rate. Um, but what we show here is that you can actually do the same with a smaller error correcting code, and you just have to discard these runs with low five values. Um, so for example, here, here, I think I can actually pull up the PDF too. I don't know, maybe that's not a good idea. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> um, but basically this, imagine a, <laughs> the sample distribution of phi is kind of like, <laughs> and if we discard just the very low values where the phi is zero and phi being zero is basically where the decoder is like, I have no idea, 50-50. So if we discard values where the decoder was uncertain, then we can see um, an improvement in the logical failure rate by an order of magnitude, and we only discarded like 10 to the negative fourth of the data. And so the idea is that you can choose how much data you want to discard and increase your logical failure rate in that way, or decrease your logical failure rate. Okay, so in conclusion, we were able to construct an efficient way to extract the soft output in surface code decoders. Um, and in doing so, we improved the decoders of concatenated codes and uh, um, improved some circuit sampling tasks. And in the future, um, it would be cool to come up with more efficient soft al output algorithms for other error correction codes and also a tighter or the other bound for the surface code result. Okay, lastly, thank you to, um, I worked on this project with Chris and John and Chris was my like main mentor throughout the project and taught me everything about error correction, hierarchical codes and soft output and was like a main driver on this project. So huge thank you to Chris. And yeah, we were working at Caltech last summer. Thank you. We have questions. Uh. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really curious about these concatenated constructions. Uh, so do you happen to know how can uh, decoders like BP take into account the soft information? I'd love to understand this better. Okay, yeah. So here, um, BP has like an initial starting value and then it like passes its information. I guess like if you were to visualize the like checks on this side and then the bits on the other side, it has some initial starting value for like initial guess for all the bits. I think that value is like really just like one half, one half, one half for everything. And so then you pass the information back and forth and you reach a, like pass that information to the checks, pass that back to the bits, and then you kind of update your, your like probability of your bit failing essentially. Oh, so it's really quite simple. Yeah. yeah, so now we just change the starting value, exactly. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask you whether you can use this soft information uh, just for the surface code decoding, right? So this gives you some confidence, you said, about whether your uh, you know, recovery is basically correct or not. Mm -hmm. Can you use something if the, the confidence is greater than one half, you know, keep it if it is lower, change it, and does this improve the threshold or something? Have you looked at this? The threshold of? Of the NWPM. Uh, decoder? Well, um, like the MWPM decoder will output, like, will output the bits that it, maybe. Oh, 
okay, it'll output the bits that it thinks has failed, and then whether or not those give a logical failure or not. And so, okay, basically like maybe more details on how the simulation was run, and maybe that'll answer the question. Um, here, we, we would sample the surface code with this, like each bit having some probably failing. Then we would run minimum weight perfect matching on it. It would tell us, uh, it, we would like, have its clusters and everything, and it would tell us whether or not it's a logical, like whether or not it failed or not. So maybe for like this phi value, uh, it, in this instance it fails, and in this instance it didn't fail. And when we like collect all that data together, that's how we kind of form this, this curve. And so if we want to improve this threshold, then yeah, we can just like take out any values with low phi values, yeah, okay. and then it will. And then flip it, yeah? Sorry? So if phi is low, you have a low confidence, right? Yeah, and then we could just throw it away, and yeah, yeah then yeah. we would only be left with values that have. Yeah. And maybe just another question. So when you think about uh, this correspondence, do you think uh, it holds beyond the bit flip noise? Like if you have more complicated noise? Yeah, so I guess we just ran bit flip noise because in surface decoding, you like decode the X and Z separately. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, if you had both of them, for sure, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have a comment, maybe a question also. Uh, so somehow what you are doing here, um, you have actually a good estimator actually for the, for the probability of decoding failure of the underlying uh, binary linear code. Somehow the toy code can be viewed as a hypergraph plot of code with property associated to repetition code. And basically what you did about repetition code, you found a good estimator actually for the decoding failure probability somehow. So have you tried to generalize the result actually to the hypergraph product construction and try to look at what could be a good description actually for the decoding failure probability for the underlying uh, code actually? Okay. In the classical code? It's kind of natural um, to do this here. Yeah, I guess our like algorithm relied on this like cluster idea. And so yeah. if the hypergraph product code like decoder doesn't have this cluster, then I'm not as sure how you would apply this directly. But I know that there is like the logical gap stuff where it's like it is more general, but it's like not efficient, where essentially you are just like calculating like calculating F and M and then like taking this ratio. And so like basically like you find what did the decoder return and then what did like what is the next closest like like basically like calculate m and then take that ratio that would like also work and i think that's like this logical gap thing um but yeah like it's just not efficient but that's like how people have generalized it okay thanks don't have any questions let's thank the speaker again <laughs>